Hello and welcome to episode nine of the Crash and Ride podcast. I'm Patrick Ferguson. I'm your host. Today's guest is Johnny A. Track, former drummer for Spiritualized and a solo artist in his own right, resident of Brighton, UK. We're both on the label Chicken Ranch Records, me with the band 5'8", and him as a solo artist. We had a great talk about um, his career as a drummer and as a solo artist. Um, it was really good. Uh, I hope you'll enjoy it. Um, right now, I'm in New York City. I've been here for a couple of days with Pinky Doodle Poodle, and um, we've been having a really good time. We walked all over the city yesterday and um, went to Rudy's Music and played some $10,000 guitars just for laughs. Uh, went and looked at some denim I couldn't afford at Naked and Famous and uh, had some amazing pizza, had some cannoli, had some espresso. It's a really good day. Um, Pinky Doodle Poodle has some dates remaining uh, in this tour. We're playing Sunday, May 5th at the Buffalo History Museum at 12.15 in the afternoon as part of the Cherry Blossom Festival there in Buffalo. We're playing May 6th in Pittsburgh at Howler's. We're playing May 7th at the Pie Shop in Washington, D.C., and we have a gig May 8th at Ground Zero in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Um, there'll be more dates in May, both with Pinky Doodle Poodle and 5-8. I'll announce those as they get closer. Uh, the Crash and Ride Espresso that the local roasting company Jittery Joe's made up for us is absolutely delicious. Uh, we've been drinking it this whole tour. Uh, we started off uh, with two pounds when we left Athens, Georgia, and we are down to uh, less than... I would guess six ounces at this point. When I was in Little Italy yesterday, I bought a new mocha pot, a Bialetti, because, um, you know, Bialetti is apparently struggling. If you're not, if you didn't have, like, college delusions about being a beatnik like I did, and um, if you're not a mocha pot user, maybe you're not familiar with the the uh, phenomenon of the, of the mocha pot stove top espresso maker. Um, Bialetti is uh, struggling to stay in business uh, after... Gosh, almost a century, and um, I just love the espresso I get out of that thing. I wanted to make sure I always had one, so I went ahead and just bought another one. Um, my friend Stephen, who creates these blends for Jittery Joe's, uh, blended this up especially to be delicious in the mocha pot, so if you're uh, at all inclined, maybe now's the time to grab a Bialetti. I'll put a link to the whole story about Bialetti in the show notes. Um, remember, if you're struggling with thoughts of self-harm, you need someone to talk to, 24 hours a day, confidential and free, is the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. You can call them. They have trained volunteers to, to help you get through your crisis and maybe direct you to some community resources where you can get some help. 1-800-273-8255. That's 1-800-273-8255. Um, man, give them a call if you're, uh, if you're struggling. I'm a big believer in the National Suicide Prevention Talk Line. Um, also, if you need to contact the show, crash and ride at protonmail.com. Uh, if you're not listening to us on our Patreon page, you can go to our Patreon page at www.patreon.com slash crash and ride, all one word, and um, maybe sign up to support the show with a modest contribution of five or ten bucks a month. Um, I'd really appreciate it. This is my only job these days other than being a rock and roll drummer. Um, anyway, I think that's all the news and announcements I have. Pardon my scratchy, sleepy voice. Um, it was a big day yesterday. I'm a little tired today. Man, we're still at the beginning of the tour. So, um, anyway, here's our interview with Johnny A Track. All right, we're here with Johnny A Track. Hello, how you doing? I'm great, man. So thanks for coming to do this. My pleasure. Um, do you live in Brighton? Yeah, I live uh, Brighton, London by sea, as it's known in the UK. Right. <laughs> Keep an eye out, sharp eye out yeah. for mod versus rockers violence. Oh, yeah, you've got to be careful. I mean, <laughs> luckily, I'm neither. So as the Beatles would say, I'm a mocker. Mocker. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. How long have you lived in Brighton? I moved there in 2007 after living here in 2005. Because, uh, yeah, Brighton seemed like the only place I could stand living after Austin. England seemed so great. <laughs> so you lived in Austin for a year? And I, I didn't quite make a year. I moved here in 05 and uh, was very lucky to be signed to a record label over here. And it was supposed to be like the big push, you know, right. for us to come over here and storm right, America. Right. And that and was with Spiritualized? That was not with Spiritualized. Uh, that was much later. Uh, that was Nick Armstrong and the Thieves. So he's still... He still lives here now. Okay. So where'd you grow up? Um, I grew up in <laughs> a tiny, about a, a town with about a population of 8,000 people uh, called Louth in Lincolnshire. Uh, so I'm a yellow belly. What does I'm, that mean? 
Uh, yellow belly is just what you're called when you're from Lincolnshire. So I'm not a coward. I'm not a coward. No. Uh, <laughs> um, it just, yeah, it's something to do with like a particular vegetation that's there, I think, that's very yellow. But yeah, Louth, which is famous for uh, having a very tall spire, 74 pubs for like 8,000 people. Um, and I think the dude that played Blofeld uh, and was in the uh, Jason films, the Halloween films comes from there. Right. <laughs> is the yellow thing, is that what we call canola, what the English call rape? <laughs> I think it is, yes. That's yes. Uh, a friend Can of mine's. Yeah. God, my friend of mine's mother was from England and um, they were driving through the countryside and she said, Oh, look at all the lovely rape. <laughs> it's very cultural differences. <laughs> uh, and that is the f that was the first one, I yeah. think, that I was introduced to where you're, we might speak the same language, but it doesn't mean the same thing. There's a great, I guess it's Churchill quote, a, uh, a people divided by a common language. Uh, that could be. Yeah. I, the only one I know by him is the one where he says about being drunk and... You're ugly. So, and, yeah. Right. The very un-PC one that he well. said. I mean, <laughs> maybe no more, more no, no less PC human being in history. Indeed, um, indeed. So, was, uh, what's it like growing up in Lincolnshire? Um, I have to be honest. It was, it was truly awful, and I was very glad to get away. And life got a lot more interesting when I moved to Nottingham, which is kind of where all my music career started. Now, uh, uh, when was that? Uh, I moved to Nottingham when I was eighteen, uh, and yeah, Lincolnshire was just. There was nothing going on. The only good thing that sort of happened is I started playing drums at 15. Mm -hmm. So actually pretty late, taught myself. And then moved to Nottingham and uh, joined a band with my brother. And met, like, if I hadn't have moved to Nottingham, even though that city has a bit of a bad reputation, if I hadn't have moved there, I wouldn't be sitting here right now. Three of my favorite yeah. bands are Nottingham bands right now. Which bands? Well, there's a band called Lords. Okay, Lords, don't know and, them. Um, Ah, uh, they're fucking brilliant. And um, there's a guy called Chris Summerlin who's in all three of those bands. Um, oh. He's in Lords. Oh, man. If I'd known you were going to mention Nottingham, I would have done a little more preparation. Ah, uh, um, yeah. No, there's a label there called Gringo Records. Oh, uh, uh, right. I think I know them. Like, I I know that name, but I don't know the people. Yeah, and and that sort of scene, there was a band. Um, they're called Cantaloupe. I know that's wrong. And um, <laughs> there's a guy called Simo, who's just lovely, who uh, is from Nottingham. And um, there were just so many great bands that I was exposed to just through knowing people on the internet. Um, and it, the great Nottingham bands. It was a great scene, and it wasn't until sort of Jake Bug came along. And and because I think in England, probably the same in America, but in England. You know, your city, so like Manchester had Oasis and Liverpool had the Beatles. London, I guess, had tons of different bands, but sure. Who was always one of them early on. You need to have that band that makes your city famous. And right. Nottingham always had, when I was there, always had this incredible scene, um, you know, spiritualized, picked some of the, you know, some of their music musicians from there. And you had, um, you know, Six by Seven, who were a sort of fam famous-ish sort of 90s band coming from there, and they were, oh you know, I was really excited about them, you know. <laughs> There's some controversy about that band. I really don't want to get into it here, but there was an amplifier that went missing, and oh, um, it was... Uh, Are we not? We Nottingham folk went out into the world, and we joined lots of bands, and we co we definitely caused a lot of trouble. And yeah. Nick Armstrong and the Thieves, That's we all met in Nottingham, and now you have right. two of the members left, like still living they're still living here they moved here in 05 and never came back to england i mean so it's a beautiful city i mean um, it's a great city for those of you who didn't listen through the intro um uh we're sitting in um uh, airbnb that um the label got for my band and with all the windows and doors open because it's an absolutely gorgeous day here in austin texas it so it's beautiful yeah um so you mentioned one brother mm -hmm. is that all the siblings or were there more um i have an older sister who has never done music in her life and uh, is always very proud of me and she comes to my gigs but also kind of thinks, but I mean, I'm a little brother so she's always going to think I'm a huge pain in the ass. Um, so she's like, you know, me and my brother, we're the black sheeps of the family because we did music and we kind of, I guess the way I always describe my career is I've done everything, you know, both of us, we've done everything except, sort of ha except have a hit record, you know. Right. I could bore you with 
my musical CV. I think we uh, we we would almost be playing like a game of what we would call top trumps or or ba- swapping baseball cards with our musical CV. I think we've both done right. some <laughs> real great stuff um, yeah. where we can kind of show off a little bit, but. But it's interesting, though. Like, I think sometimes people have a hard time um, accepting the fact that uh, if you've played in a band that had a hit record that you're not rich now. Uh, Do you know what's really weird is I would consider myself successful, but anyone who would know me possibly would not agree with that. Right. Because the, the, the perception is, and probably that's probably changed a lot now, I would say, thanks to social media and bands going online, young bands saying, yeah, okay, I was on, you know, uh, uh, my band is uh, doing really well at the minute and we're in Pitchfork and I was on telly last night, but now I'm back working at McDonald's today because the the money isn't coming in. And the perception was thanks to, you know, the 60s rock and roll scene and the 70s scene and the 80s hair, you know, the, the hair, I think the hair rock movement and the 80s selfishness phase was like everyone that was in a band was going to be a multimillionaire and had to get the drinks in and we lived in mansions and that terrible Nickelback song you know rock and roll star which is a you know terrible song by by a band that I'm not a big fan of um kind of that was that's what everyone imagines we're all doing right I don't actually know that song so it well you know yeah not missing Cut out. my blessings. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I think there's a night. People are like, oh, so you must be famous then, or you, can, you know, if you're in a band, oh, you must be rich, or you must be famous, or, or you know, that question you always get where you say, yeah, I play in a band, and they go, anyone I've heard of, and you sort of think, should I say, you know, who I am or what I've done? And I mean, I, you know, I think for yourself now that you're doing, I mean, you played with the Psychedelic Furs, which is right. a big deal for me. Um, it was a big deal for me too. Oh. I can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, let's be honest. Like, I got the call on Thursday. Um, I flew on Friday. First rehearsal Saturday. Half a rehearsal Sunday. First show Monday night. Is that how it happens? Wow. Yeah, well, um, my good friend Hugo uh, was supposed to do the show. His father uh, became terminally ill, was diagnosed as being terminally ill, and Damn. had just months, you know. And so he was going to do the tour, and they called and, and asked me to, to come to it and um, on Hugo's recommendation. So I had a, about 24 hours to learn the songs. Jeez. And I didn't write charts then. I write charts now. I oh, learned my, learn my fucking lesson on that one. Yeah. Because it's a lot of information to remember. And um, so now I write, I write music. And I highly recommend to anyone who wants to do session work to download the simple drum chart. And I'll put a link to that in the, po- the description of the show. Yeah, learn, learn to do it. <laughs> yeah, it, it, saved me a, it saved me a lot of grief in the meantime. But yeah, so... Cost. And you know, those guys, they've had a lot of drummers and uh, oh. they really wanted someone to walk in and know the songs and right. I didn't. It was stressful. It wasn't an easy tour at first, but then we sort of clicked into a groove by the time we got out of Detroit and everything was sort of, it was good. It's that funny thing though, isn't it? That often the best experiences and the, and the most success you have can come from like the worst places, like that terrible tragedy that happened to you friend and then you're thrown into something that everyone else is going oh wow you've made it you're doing this you're doing this amazing right. thing and yet actually you know uh, like any place of work not everyone gets along not everyone's your friend everyone has tons of insecurities and unless uh you know you are very centered and 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 feeling really confident in yourself you, you can get you know you can get thrown off well i think uh, it's a sort of uh, consistent refrain on on my podcast, and it'll it comes up a lot that I th- I think fame is a terrible trap to fall into. <laughs> yeah, that's really bad for people. Um, it is to be famous. Um, I I live in a town with a couple of huge rock bands, and um, yeah, you I've do. been fortunate enough to to work with some of those guys on different projects, and and I think that sometimes it's been difficult for them to navigate a lot of the sort of incredibly insincere relationships that pop up in the wake of you becoming famous. I, I, yeah, uh, I can't really, I can't imagine because I've been sort of lucky enough to be around all that kind of stuff. And you know what? I'm a, hu- I'm a huge, uh, I love a cliche, mm-hmm. I love a quote. And Oscar Wilde came up with, for me, the, um, the, the coolest way to kind of look at that issue. There's only two tragedies in life. Uh, one is not getting what one wants. And the other is getting it. Yeah, absolutely. So 
y you know, and it's really weird whenever you, <laughs> whenever you read um, interviews with people who are getting what you think you want and you look at what they have and you think that's what you want and, and they don't sound like they want it or, or they, you know, they seem sad about it and, and you're there imagining, yeah, but what, you're on, you're on a jet airplane every day and you're playing to thousands of people and you're doing this and you're doing that. I mean, it's just, it's, yeah, it's just so subjective. And I mean, well, I think that's one of the traps. It's part yeah. of the terrible yeah. trap of being famous is that, oh God, don't complain about it. Everyone will hate everything about you. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Well, it's what I, it's like, you know, if you're starving and you look over and there's someone, you know, who's uh, having a lovely meal and you're like, oh, man, that looks really good. And they're like, eh, it's not that great. Yeah, yeah like, I've had better. Yeah. And your stomach is absolutely empty. It's going to be like, fuck you. But what they don't tell you is that what they're feeding this other person is poisonous, you know, and it's destroying their life. And so, you know, the, the, the sort of knife's edge you have to walk um, as a successful musician, I think, um, or successful artist of any kind is remaining grateful, protecting your relationships that are sincere and real and you've had before your whole life changed and also like keeping a sharp eye on your money. So. Yeah, and I guess as well, there's this huge myth that it's going to like fill the you know the void in your life or i mean uh, one of the biographies i read once was about janis joplin someone who i think she thought that her fame was gonna really fix the reputation she'd had at home and, and solve all the bullying issues she'd had right. and obviously it was a book about a person i've never met and i, I it could be rubbish it, but it was just quite interesting that someone else's perception of her of her career was just someone going i'm going to show you all Right, you picked on me, and I'm going to prove you wrong. Mm -hmm. And and there are some people out there who are, who aren't going to care how well or how badly you do. They're just gonna they just see that you're you can be triggered easily. Right. And if unless you're very cool with yourself in the first place, mm -hmm. you know they say more money, more problems. You know, and it, it's only going to make your life better if if you're going to allow it to make your life better. I mean, look at how many people we see. Yeah, well, if fame was so great, why do so many famous rock and roll people end up as heroin addicts? Or take their own lives. Right. Like, every time I'm hearing, I heard a Kurt Cobain song today, and I heard a Chris Cornell song today, yeah. and it just made me think, as I'm wandering around Austin, trying to, you know, pursue, Push it over. Yeah. pursue my thing, and, and just keep doing what I'm doing, and not give up on, on you know, a, a, a long-term dream to sort of live the life I want to live, the way I want to live it. Mm -hmm. And you hear those songs and you think, wow, they had everything. And yet yeah. it didn't seem they to just make had any money. difference. I really think that becoming rich and famous only solves one problem, and that's not having enough money. Yeah. yeah. And it doesn't really solve any other problem. And it aggravates so many other problems, especially if you have any any depression or anxiety issues. I mean, imagine having anxiety issues and every night, every night. It is incumbent upon you to not only make your living, but the living from everybody around you to go out and be in front of 15,000 people. And I think as well, possibly, I think it's more the the, ev the other things. I mean, that bit, I would, I, I would guess, and I'm guessing this, I would guess that that's probably the bit where it's the easiest. The hard part is arriving at an airport, like, like when I arrived at the airport Thursday night, and mm -hmm. I'd been up since 6 a.m., and... You know, I'd met some pretty grumpy people on the plane and I was in the same clothes and it was really hot and I was tired and I haven't been well all year. I feel really sick. I don't feel as great as I should. And I got off the plane and there was no one there to meet me and there was crazy stuff going on at the airport and I wasn't feeling great. Luckily, there wasn't any fans to recognize me and bother me and see me looking like absolute crap. Mm -hmm. But when you're famous... Right, there's no avoiding. There's going to be a guy from TMZ with his fucking cell phone out. They're going to take photos, and there's going to be this, you know, there's going to be this whole thing on you. And, right. and did and Johnny Eight Track gain fifteen pounds? Yeah, like, right. And oh my god, look yeah. at the state of his skin, and blah blah blah, right, and, right, and, right. and just oh, you look terrible. And you, and and what I always find quite crazy because you can sort of see everybody's personal little crises online now is when there's like a video that says about what a jerk somebody is. Uh, you know what what kind of a jerk a celebrity is and yeah. someone will post about the one time they met that person like once right. and they didn't treat them you know you know I met this rock star and they were rude to me 
problems. Right. Probably because they had some bad news or they were sick or something. And of course, we have to be humble and respectful. Right. But everyone makes mistakes. Well, everybody I has shit days. Did. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit more though about like so. I want to back up a little bit and talk. So it's just it's you, your brother, your older sister. Yes. Is that everybody? Yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah, in terms of um, siblings and stuff. Yeah. 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 And and so this is in the north of England. Uh, it's uh, you know what, Lincolnshire. Uh, sort of, uh, ab- just above the Midlands, really. So okay. there's the Midlands, and then Lincolnshire's a little bit sort of further up. So, you know, I'm half Scottish, and my mum's Yorkshire, proper mm-hmm. northern. But right. But I've always had that kind of Midlands vibe, and Nottingham is very much the Midlands. So and yeah. so, kind of grey. Am I misreading? Is like sort of. Oh, it was. I mean, it, the the thing is, the weird thing about like, uh, <coughs> rock and roll and everything is is. Is uh, and the great thing for people in in the UK is having this <laughs> kind of grey and miserable place to battle against, you right. know, because you want to create to escape. Right, 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 right. And and God, if I hadn't have been in a band, you know, I, you, there's you get when you listen to the rich heritage of of the music that comes from the UK that's still happening now. Sure. Um, I mean, y- you get that from other parts of the world as well, but it, I guess it just gravitated from there. When did you pick up the drums? Not till I was 15 years old. Okay. And and I didn't learn to play guitar till I, properly till I was like 29, 30 years old. I still haven't. It's definitely. Well, I mean, I, I, I say I didn't decide and tell people <laughs> <laughs> that I can play guitar um, yeah. until, you know. Uh, and I mean, I, I just, I use... I, I use those tools as like the the you know the, to get the song across. Mm-hmm. You know? um, so yeah, I I taught myself and and started late because you know I just thought well you just join a band and write some songs and become a millionaire. Right. Well, that seems <laughs> yeah. That's, <laughs> that's how we all started, wasn't it? Generation X. I think. Right. Yeah. And um, how did you end up in Nottingham? Um, because from uh, school, my brother was living there, and he said, "Come and join a band with me." What and were we, you studying? Um, I was studying art at the time. I thought I was going to be a famous painter. Really? And then realized that, yeah, that do st- was... Do you still paint? No, I haven't painted in years, which is a terrible, terrible shame. And, uh, yeah, my mom still, uh, every year, talks to me about how, you know, you should be painting as well. So, uh, yeah, uh, but I, the thing is with me is I put these very high watermarks of success and pressure on myself i'm not judgmental to other people but for me you know uh if i you know if i haven't played to big crowds and if i haven't done tv and if i haven't um you know not getting a record deal etc you know all these sort of things that actually nowadays don't really matter anymore Mm -hmm. in in the digital age and the social media age sure so like i uh, with painting I've just got this real fear of when I pick up the paintbrush, the first thing I paint is probably going to be awful. But I've got to go through that because I, I was an awful drummer when I was 15. And right. Some assholes out there would probably say I was an awful drummer or I still am an awful drummer uh, or was an awful drummer when I was 21 or 25. But you always you get, know that you always get better, right? Yeah. But the the worst critic is inside your head. Oh right? yeah, yeah. The I mean, uh, let's imposter be syndrome. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's just part of uh, every time I sit down and play the drums. You know, I think, <laughs> man, if only I really knew how to do this. I mean, I know uh, some guys. You know, I mean, the guy, the Jake Kreger, who was the first interview for Crash and Ride, is one of the great drummers uh, in America, and um, and he told me, you know, I just wish I was better. <laughs> like, uh, really. <laughs> But I think that like, you know, and this sort of brings me to like the discussion that I've had with a lot of people about why is it that some bands start using opiates and suddenly become amazing bands? And it's because I think that that Keith Richards riff that you sort of banged out on your guitar and thought that's derivative and sounds just like a Keith Richards riff. Like, you know, when you're you silence that inner critic by like pummeling it with drugs. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and and you're off to the races, you know, um, and it allows you to sometimes to write reductive or simple stuff that actually resonates more than you'd expect because it's simple, you know, and I think that that's sort of drugs are a great productivity tool and then they try to kill you. Uh, they, I guess they remove that sort of, all right, let's do this properly now, you know, let, they, you know, it's always funny when you go out and everybody's very well behaved at first 
and right. then and as it gets lubricated with some booze and whatever it turns into a you know it turns into a ad, you know you get some people add music add drinks you've got a party you right. know um and it in, i think it just enables people to get a bit more in touch with that self that goes you know the angel and devil side the devil side starts to win right go on yeah, there's a no magic one will point. Know. <laughs> there's, there's a magic point where it's good and then it rapidly deteriorates sometimes so rapidly that everything falls apart you know well there's that brilliant scene and one of my favorite movies ever my favorite rockumentaries is dig that one about the brian jones yeah, yeah, massacre yeah. and the danny warhols where the girl that sings them and goddamn, i can't remember her name the girl with who would collaborate with them and now and again mm-hmm I she, can't remember her name either. I can't so remember sorry. her name. Yeah. And, and it, I, 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 ter- I, you know, There's but, someone listening to this screaming the name yeah, at yeah. their speakers. Yeah, yeah, but this is because I don't do drugs because it messes with your memory. Right. Um, <laughs> right. And um, So she, does not getting enough sleep, by the way. But no, not, not getting enough sleep or yeah. not, not eating very well. But she says, you know, all these bands in the 60s that, uh, that took all these drugs and did all this stuff, they got famous first. Right. Like they didn't, you know, the Stones and the Beatles and and Jimi Hendrix, etc., and all these bands that I guess a lot of people look at and go, yeah, that's how it was done. They didn't arrive. Maybe they smoked some weed and stuff, but they didn't arrive doing all that stuff. They were quite clean cut. If you go back and right. look, right, right, right. And when Jimi H- Hendrix was a session guitarist, right. where you would get fired if you weren't on top form. Um, yeah, they were just at work and making it work, and then. Yeah. Someone said, here's a load of money to mm. you, you young, vulnerable 20-something. And, and here's a load of pressure. <laughs> and here's a load of yeah. pressure. Here's a load of expectations. <laughs> here's a load of insincere, dishonest people. Um, and if you're feeling a bit down, well, we've got, a, we've got some pills. Yeah, have this. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, you know, some people can handle it. Some people can. Lemmy, I guess, handled it until yeah. he passed away. Uh, well, uh, I think one of the great illusions, though, is that, like, I'm going to be like Lemmy. You know? <laughs> Uh, but that that's the thing that's a, going back to that thing of look you look at someone else's dinner plate or someone else's situation sure. um you know uh, you can get tricked because you just get a snapshot right you get a little snapshot of what their life looks like and mm-hmm. that's kind of how it works right like we just take a picture of all the best bits well i think that's the great power of the penelope spheris bit where she always films musicians making breakfast because <laughs> <laughs> It ends up uh, being darkly comic, but also really illuminating that, like, you know, these guys aren't really... Like, there's only 45 to 90 minutes a day where they're held to a high productivity standard, and the rest of the time, yeah. they're sort of left to their own devices. And yeah. That, you know, morning for whatever whatever morning means to Ozzy Osbourne, you know, 1230 in the afternoon, um, he's maybe not high-functioning. Yeah. And... and, and I guess until uh, I mean, it depends on on what kind of genre you're in and what kind of artist you are and 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 what record label you're in and, and lots of other different factors where you know because if you're in like a big pop band, right? That's like having a that's like having a full time corporate occupation. Yes, I've got no idea. I I was in a rock and roll band for a while and and obviously played for you know a, a sort of a. a it's like you know psychedelia rock and roll band and and I've I've played in terrible covers bands and and I've and I've had a regular job as well um and now I call, consider myself a solo artist so I get to come and go as I please right but if you're in some like big pop band that's just that's 6 a.m. starts and right and and it has to be exactly the same it has to be night. exactly the same and it has to fit into that high you know like if you are i don't know harry styles or something right and maybe he controls i mean i don't even know maybe he controls his career better but um you know uh that that's just something that i guess for me and and for a lot of my peers we we just wouldn't even know what that is like and i heard a great interview with dave ellich who was talking about being on tour with miley cyrus and um, oh okay yeah he was just like you're doing 18 to 20 months of of four to five nights a week of exactly the same parts right. played to exactly the same click track because the dancers and the other performers needed to be exactly the same every mm-hmm. night and you hit these points where suddenly you just can't play it anymore like your brain just throws out a null right and you just forget a part and i don't know i can't imagine what that's like but and and probably the absolute you know 
pastings you get if, if anything is wrong or any behavior is, you know, incorrect. Like I remember going to see the Black Eyed Peas play and seeing their show, which was just insane. It was right. brilliant. And I'm not even like a big fan of that band. Yeah. But just looking at it, just going, wow. But Big screens uh, and... And and just yeah. like if fireworks go off and, and people are somersaulting and, and the bass player's got to do a solo and the drummer's got to hit a cymbal that goes mm. at exactly the right spot when this thing happens. And if you miss that... Right. Or you miss the cue where the lighting guy is doing something. Right, or Stonehenge is only 18 inches tall. Or Stonehenge is only 18 <laughs> inches tall. Yeah. Or you get trapped in the weird cocoon yeah. thing. <laughs> Man, I got to briefly just interject. 5-8 was on tour one time, and we right. been on tour at that point for about four years. You know, we were doing 200 shows a year, and Amazing. we got to a hotel room somewhere, and we put the TV on, and Stonehenge was on. I mean, um, Spinal Tap Spinal was on. Tap was on. And we were so stoked, like, oh, man, Spinal Tap. I haven't seen this in years. And then about 20 minutes of watching Spinal Tap, and someone was like, let's just turn it off, man. <laughs> because it's like looking in the mirror. Oh, it's so personal. It was it's, so real and so painful. It, it's, it, yeah. it's the Those craziest guys, thing ever. Yeah. Oh, they got right in there, man. They knew exactly. But it was it was alarming. Good, let's talk more about daily life in your Mon- Nottingham before yeah. sort of stepping onto the thrill ride. Yeah. So you were in school, you were studying painting. Yep. And do you have favorite painters? Like, um, I liked all the kind of people that messed with reality. Uh, so really the surrealists. Um, uh, I, uh, more before before that, like more sort of. Back to uh, Max Ernst. <laughs> I guess I'm just going to throw yeah. a few names at you. Uh, so like Egon Clay, Kandinsky, oh, okay, uh, Munch. Uh, obviously, Va- I mean Van Gogh, right? Sure. Amazing. And then all the Cubists, you know, and Picasso, like at various different times, just people that would really. Sc- I mean, but then of course you look at the stuff where it, it's like a photographic image, and it's right. just Vermeer and that kind of thing. It's just mind blowing. So. So uh, I know that a lot of people sort of start trying to paint cubist or surrealist stuff yeah. right out of the gate, and they <laughs> haven't really learned. Like, did you go through a long technique? No, that was me. Right. <laughs> that was me. Right. Complete. Just, just. Oh, I like doing that. You know. Right. Uh, so. Uh, What's well, like trying to start playing drums as Buddy Rich? You know. Yeah, because you, you kind of do. You kind of you, uh, you copy records. Uh, yeah, I used I, to play along to records and imagine myself doing that. Right. I've always uh, lately I'm seeing a lot of, especially young feminists, say, "God, give me the self confidence of a mediocre white man." And I think, <laughs> <laughs> oh wow, yeah, I think you you should have seen me start playing drums. You know? Oh. <laughs> That is the best thing I've heard. Yeah, no, <laughs> uh, I, I mean I get it, you know, but um, yeah, you start somewhere. Hopefully, it's somewhere where you learn fundamentals. Uh, Questlove once was quoted as saying, "Every time I hear somebody talking about geniuses, I go see what they're doing, and it's somebody executing fundamentals with passion and commitment." Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, it's all about the rudiments, right? Uh, I. <laughs> It's, I, I wish, do you know what? I guess the only thing I've started to realize is I don't know. I, I, I don't have, all I know is I know nothing. Just, right. just to throw in a favorite, you know, more cliches because I love those and, and well, sayings. Fa- so there's a Nick Cave quote about cliches. They're just ideas that have so much power we try to discredit them. Uh, yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. That'll, that'll do me. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. I, uh, I, yeah. I don't even, uh, I always find it very illuminating because I love to watch documentaries about famous movies that were made and, and and great movies about music and I love to read articles about all these things that have inspired us and live in our everyday lives that have this ideal and this dream and this thing that we want to sort of get to. Right. And everyone that's done it and everyone that's been really successful, if you ask them how it started and how they made it, they never give you an answer because they don't know. No, I, I George, think... George Lucas didn't know how he made Star Wars. Right. That's why he can't make it again. Ridley Scott doesn't know how Alien turned out so well. Right. Um, the Beatles didn't go to Hamburg and go, it's all right, lads, we'll do Hamburg, and, right. then, and then it's going to be great. The White Album will come out and we'll all hate each other, or, or Sgt. <laughs> Peppers will come out and it'll be brilliant. Yeah. No, I think that that <laughs> is... The great mystery. If you read Neil Young's uh, biography, Shaky, or um, I think so, what's it called, Mr. Shaky? I can't remember now. Um, 
it becomes clear that he just tries something, but tries it with so much passion, conviction, and obsession that it becomes a thing. But then he just moves on to something else. It's not like he has a formula or a plan, you know. I mean, all those records that nobody listens to, like Trans and and um, Landing on Water, or whatever the those late seventies records were. I mean, he was just really searching for the next thing, you know. Right. Don't think he knows what makes Neil Young great. I mean, he's not into marketing, is he? I would imagine. I don't. I don't. I don't think the greats, if we shall call them that, I don't think any of them really were. They were just. I I was I always like to think of because I look at say someone like Jack White who's still around now and yeah to me I think that guy and actually Jason Pierce from Spiritualize actually people who've managed to achieve fantastic commercial success in compared to mine right uh, but have retained their authenticity and their credibility and the the longevity of their career to be able to you know and all they've ever done is create music right the like the funniest thing <laughs> that ever happened was i was sitting with jason pierce in a pub one day and he said how much do people who work in a bar earn and uh he's like yeah i, I don't know because he's like I, uh, you know i've never had i've never had a job before <laughs> he's never had a job <laughs> he, he just went straight from school and university i mean you know this is what he told me and um so yeah it was just it was just i mean maybe he because he's a very charming well, person. Well, but I think it's also important to remember that if you, even if you are like slugging it out, waiting tables or tending bar, or being a barista, there's no, there's no shame in that. I mean, yes, capitalism is that. capricious and random, you know, and it can be an absolute shit show. I mean, I know plenty of people whose lives are ruined by. Um, I mean, I sort of look at the success of Kurt Cobain and, and Nirvana, and I think those guys wanted to be about as big as the Melvins. That was their big plan, yeah. and they they were sort of swept up by a machine they didn't have any control over and I think it ruined their lives. Yeah, I mean... Well, certainly Kurt Cobain's life. I mean, I think Dave Grohl seems to be handling it fairly well. He handled it. He handled it. um, But, you know... But then again, it's like, it's it's us looking at... You know, we... You get to know someone for five minutes, you know, like I've... you've, You've... I think both of us, we've met people where, like, when I was playing in a band and we supported Oasis and you hang around someone like Liam Gallagher I didn't get to know him we're not buddies I, I right. he, he was just him and his brother very kindly invited us to go on tour and they treated us really really well um, uh, but how, how do you get an insight into who those people are and, and how they feel it's just that we care about that whereas right. as, as it goes further and further down the ladder Right. And as we go out there, because we're at South by Southwest right now, right. it was, God, today I was sitting with someone having a coffee and it's just like, wow, we were watching a band and I won't, I won't say their name because I can't remember it actually. We were watching right. a band and they were brilliant and they were at Guero's and there was probably about 20 people watching them and it was tight and it was brilliant and the singer was fantastic and the songs were catchy. And I just was saying, God, all over Austin right now, there are incredible bands playing that would change some people's lives. Right. And they're playing a no one. Well, it's a fun, right? It's just like the NBA. You got all these uh, brilliant uh, yeah, like, college level yeah, athletes. It's not just music, of course. Right. No, very true. Yeah. <coughs> it's just a very narrow number of people who can sort of become mass media celebrities. But I think that the important thing is to focus on playing as best you can and writing as best you can and, 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 and build your community around it, you know? Um, because I don't know, I guess, like I've said a million times, I don't know that fame is all it's cracked up to be, you know? I mean, I look at bands like Fountains of Wayne too, who were just brilliant. Right. Right. And never really broke through, but like, well, there's a, a long list of, yeah, I can, and, and many of my of bands. bands are in that list of, right. You know, coulda, woulda, shoulda, nearly made it. So yeah. I always find it funny that people slag off one hit wonders. Oh God, they're only a one-hit wonder band. It's like God. How many of us would dream about like being a one-hit, having right. a hit? Probably got a pretty nice guitar and amplifier out of it, and probably yeah. bought a house. You know, yeah. that's not the end of the world. TMZ's not chasing them around with fucking cameras. You know, no, no. And and I guess um, the the thing out of all of it is it, it comes back to that confidence, and the thing out of all of it is is going back to the individual, right. and and having the power and the confidence 
to say, this is where I'm supposed to be and this is what I'm doing and just ignoring other people. And you know what, the thing, that I guess, the thing that probably the best advice I've ever been given is like, have a life and do other things. And right. Because if you, if you, for whatever you're doing, because it's funny, we keep talking about music because that's what we're in right now. That's what we do. But there's, but there's yeah. a ton of people around that, you know, that um, if you're, uh, if you're obsessing over something and you're chasing something constantly at the cost of your personal health, right. your family, your friendships, your you know all these things that we do actually need to stay well. If you if you aren't looking after those things, you, you you're going to end up in a bit of a hole. You're going to end up you know potentially hitting rock bottom yeah. and then throw in some booze and drugs and and, yeah. and some fame with that. It's gonna it's gonna be it's gonna be tricky. I th- I, uh, so there's this thing though about you sort of set off on this path to be a professional creative person, and for me. I can speak for myself with utter certainty that I invest way too much of my own sort of self esteem in, in in doing well at this thing. You know, if I have a bad audition, if I get fired from a band, if I have a bad show, man, it cuts like a straight job, you know, like waiting tables or working in a, some shit box job, you know, and it goes, I have a bad day. I'm like, oh, well, this isn't <laughs> what I do, really. It's not important. Mm. But, man, bad gigs, bad auditions, being rejected, it's it's a knife in my heart, man. That's and, rough. Uh, yeah, I think just because we sort of choose this as our thing, you know, and uh, it was it's always been the primary thing for me. So, Well, my, my thing was always I – wanted to just be able to do what i wanted to do whenever i wanted to do it and 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 try not to hurt anybody whilst i was doing that that was Mm -hmm. you know because i've just always seen so many people around me who hate their job or hate their life or hate their partner and it's like right you know we're not here that long (laughs) right (laughs) like we're not we don't live forever (laughs) right uh so probably you know try and enjoy your life as best you can so um so yeah that was my so how did you end up getting uh, mixed up with 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 spiritualized um yeah because if if it weren't i've got to say if it weren't for that i think i'd probably be a lot more miserable than i am now that's kind of something i'm incredibly proud of yeah and feel lucky to have done so you're in a band right you're playing with someone yeah uh <laughs> i was in a band it's the nottingham thing that's right. why like I, I should never ever be mean about nottingham really because i wouldn't yeah my life is so i'm you know i i've got a lot to be grateful for and and how i got in with spiritualized uh started out as a good thing and then a bit like your story about the psychedelic first unfortunately if a friend of mine was drumming for him and he and he got he got very sick but we developed a, a, a relationship where he knew he could trust me to just come in, do the record, and then and then and then go again. Sure. And also, his guitarist buddy had seen me playing in bands and really liked the way I played, kind of like Ringo Starr and John Bonham. And everyone used to say I've played a lot like Keith Moon, which I just don't do anymore because it hurts too much to. It's <laughs> a lot of work to man. play like it was. Yeah. It was a lot of work. But I want. Yeah. I wanted. I I wanted to be. That was my goal when I was a drummer was I wanted to I always loved the bands where you knew who everyone in the band was right because it's awful being faceless in 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 that situation mm-hmm. um and so the guitarist and the drummer had sort of you know highlighted me in other acts and yeah they were going to do the fifth album Amazing Grace mm-hmm. in 2002 and the drummer got sick so it was really it was, <laughs> it was actually when I look back on it and it's something that still kind of gets me upset nowadays it's like it was this great opportunity out of this horrific thing and I couldn't get excited about it. And it, and my buddy dying of, you know, my friend dying of oh, cancer died. at the time. Oh, that's terrible. But he got better. He got better, oh, but you, you didn't yeah. know that at the time. But he, he was, you know, he, he was he was sick. He was potentially going to die. Mm-hmm. And, and so it was really hard to enjoy it. It was yeah. really hard to celebrate it. And I went to him and I said, look, do you mind that if I, you know, is it okay that I like talk to people about this and are you okay you know and I was almost it was like it was dead weird and I'm sure you know at the time maybe it was tough for Jason as well because he was just like look that's your friend he's all right with it because sometimes I talk to him about like how 
it was brilliant, but I felt awful about it. Mm-hmm. It was, but I'm really, pr- it's, it's, I'm really torn and you can actually hear me, I'm getting upset about it now because I'm really proud of what I did. Right. Um, but it felt, it, it's, a, it. it's a bit like, it's a bit like being on the side and, and you go and you, sc- like, and you're in a, 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 you're in a sports team and you score the winning goal, but like one of your teammates is like, completely destroyed his leg and his football career is like over for a few years right or or like john hurt getting the uh the role in alien because the other guy got really sick yeah so it was it was a double-edged sword in that way but then it but then sort of doing that and feeling like i was part of that gang and that i could you know do music because when when you when you try to be ambitious and maybe gob off about it a bit too much and that would be something if i was going to give advice to anyone it's just go and do what you want to do but don't tell anyone about it until you're there right Um, because i had no idea i was going to end up playing for such a cool band and tell me how long was your tenure with them well i did that record Mm -hmm. in 2002 and then thought i'd never play with them again my friend got better i went to watch them play and i went to the show to be like look i'm in the audience you're on the stage i didn't steal your gig i did for you what you wanted me to do Mm -hmm. And then I joined Nick Armstrong and the Thieves, mm-hmm. and, they, and that's a whole other story, which there probably isn't enough time to talk about today. Yeah. Um, when did that start, though? Uh, 2002 with Spiritualized, and then 2003 with Nick Armstrong and the Thieves, and then mm-hmm. I thought I'd never play with them again, and then weirdly, they came back into my life uh, out of the blue in 2013. Right. And then I was with them for couple of years made another record with them and then they're here on the 23rd of march i think but mm-hmm. in austin you know, in austin yeah and they're doing a full tour and um jason changed the lineup again because it's his band and he can do whatever he wants so yeah. i'm still friends with everybody i'm making an album uh with the guitarist and i went to the show again to right. show gratitude solidarity and to show that uh, you know like i mean of course i'm like you were saying any kind of setback yeah i'm i'd rather be doing the shows but sure i mean there's bigger stuff to worry about in the world yeah. to be honest yeah 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 and and actually i think what it's more about is the way that people uh it's just a bit like if you don't get an audition or maybe you don't get a promotion at work or something it's more about what other people think and sure. you know oh yeah I wonder why he got sacked, or I wonder how he pissed the band off, you know, yeah. to not be in that. So it was it was a pretty short tenure, but it was. I mean, I'm very proud of it, and I made two records with one of the best. How many How many records have you made as Johnny Eight Track? Oh, I'm on my. I'm on. I've done three, mm-hmm. uh, which will all be out on Chicken Ranch eventually. Yeah. Um, and I'm on my fourth. Sure. And and that was kind of a, um, uh, you know, uh, that came from a reaction of always you know as a drummer you're constantly working to help other people get their records out yes um and it was i guess it was just me thinking well maybe i should give it a shot too and mm-hmm. and, uh, and uh, i mean if it wasn't for playing with spiritualized and playing with the armstrong i wouldn't have had the confidence to sort of sure. do that myself as well because i think y- you can use other people's success and you can use other people's kudos to sort of be like hey I've got something to say too. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know that joke, right? What's the last thing a drummer says before he quits the band? Oh, I do. Yeah. Hey, fellas, I wrote a song. Oh, yeah. God, that's the yeah, yeah. that's life. That's life imitating right. art, right there. So your, your <laughs> first record came out with Chicken Ranch Win. Well, the first record they put out was in 2016. Mm-hmm. Um, What's it called? Uh, that one was called Eight Hours Work, Eight Hours Sleep, Eight Hours for What We Will. A snappy title. Right, well, but it's IWW. IWW. That's the Wobblies, man, International Workers of the World. That was their big push to establish the eight-hour workday as the standard. Have you seen all the wood carvings? There's all these great, like, mm. historical IWW um, graphics to go along with that slogan. I, I mean, I just... You're talking to an old-school lefty today. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I'm just... Uh, Lover, not a fighter. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a. Uh, I, th- I fucking love the title because it's always been something I really believed in. It, I, it, for me, what that came from was, uh, f- for like I said earlier, all I ever sort of wanted to do was just be able to do what I want to do when sure. I want to do it. You've got to work. There's just some stuff you have to do. Let's imagine, you know, you're on a desert island. You've got to get the water, or y- or you're not going to survive. 
but what's always really sad is it feels like everyone is forced to choose between what they want to do for what they have to do right. but the concept of what that really is is very skewed and I think and so, yeah. sort of yesterday the song that jumped out at me in your set when I was watching you play it was oh. the one do what you like Oh yeah, I'll yeah. do what you want. Yeah, do yeah. Do you want? Yeah, yeah it's a yeah. fucking great song. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. No, we'll put it. I'll put a link to it in the um, in the show description. I think people should hear that song. And uh, it it was, it was a, uh, kind of written as a little thing for myself. And we were talking in the before we started yeah. earlier about, um, people suffering. It's good to try and reach out to them and because the worst thing for people when they're going through depression going through anxiety mm -hmm. can, contemplating into their life is to f at the ending their life is to feel like no one cares no one's been through that everyone else is off having the best time they're off having a great party and you're not invited right and uh, you know <coughs> my songs are just sort of a thing to say I feel like total crap too because mm -hmm. I only ever write when I feel terrible right. and lonely and unwanted and depressed and unlovable and full of self-loathing and that's the only time I feel like writing and then I sort of try and disguise some of that but some of it comes straight through and it's it's like trying to be like a little bit of a lighthouse for people to go I feel terrible too come and hang out with me right and we'll and uh, yeah you know. you've know. you always struggled with those sorts of feelings oh I mean um I think I joined I think I sort of did music in in a in a way to kind of I felt like if I could do something that would just take me where I thought looked like a great place to be it would get me out I mean I grew up in a like we talked about I grew up in a really cruddy little town dark and yeah gray. just just you know I won I wonder whether it, people would be different if we all sort of grew up in a really lovely place to live with great weather i mean i don't i don't know i think I we'd all play know. reggae because that's what happens right possibly <laughs> so <laughs> which i mean i would may i would There's have been no cool chance with that, that <laughs> punk rock is ever going to come out of kingston you know although kingston actually is not a lovely place it's got lovely weather but it's got a pretty high crime rate probably not a good example well but uh, and and there's an element of i mean i, I know what you mean i yeah. mean it's it's um but it, it's it's quite funny because one of the things, one of the things that uh, I sort of try and think about all the time now is uh, because I've I've yeah I've suffered. I think a lot of creative people suffer from if they didn't. It's it's a curse and it's a blessing because if you didn't feel like that, you wouldn't create all this amazing stuff. Right. But then if it doesn't get to that success level that other people perceive, and if you've gone around like a bit like you know when someone goes on American Idol mm -hmm. and they quit their job and they tell their friends to go screw themselves and they you know say right I'm off to be a star. Right. And then they turn them down. And right. Have to go back. Right. Right. Know, right. Or if you say to your parents, you know, I'll show you, and they're going get a real right. job, and you're like, going, I right. don't want to then right. you're, you're creating a very big rod for your back and mm -hmm. one of the things I <laughs> one of the things uh, I've, I've thought about is there's a lot of conversations that you can end up having with lots of people that I feel like I've got to stop having and other people have got to stop having just for your own kind of ability to move forward and to not get embroiled in that kind of when you are feeling down and when you're feeling lost you know you can start having these conversations and it can happen. Musicians all get together and they sit together, and, and and we, and particularly for Generation X, you know, probably a bit different for people who've grown up in the digital age and the social media age. You can start having these conversations that can kind of perpetuate all these things that probably don't help you. you yeah. Know? Um. Like I think a lot of the conversations that a lot of people our age will have is just about how. You know, there's no money in the in stuff anymore, or that. Um, you know, j yeah. just that you know, you know the things. Yeah, but yeah, I think it it's is. a big mistake. I think that we've sort of people fall into where they measure their success, their artistic success, in commercial terms, which is such a trap to fall into. Because yes, so. I mean, Nick Nick Drake didn't make a fucking dime. Oh my God, he's a perfect example. Yeah, he's brilliant. Pink Moon, one of my top five records of all time. He was dead before it came out. He was he moved back home with his parents, right, and um, ended up taking an overdose. And he never played live, and no one knew who he was. He had no idea of the impact. He John would have. fucking Bonham. 
died thinking he was becoming a dinosaur and irrelevant because people Whoa. were sort of talking about how great Stuart Copeland was. And I was, didn't know that. Oh, man. Bonham was in an incredible hole. Like, he was incredibly depressed. And Isn't it was saying, terrible. I guess my time has come. I'm a dinosaur. Oh, that is terrible. John Bonham. John Bonham. The only drummer that matters, really. Uh, I mean, I love Ringo. No, Ringo, look. Like, and I love Mooney. Yeah. And I love Charlie Watts. But I wouldn't but, be the drummer that I am without John Bonham. Well, I, I, for me, I love Ringo in because he represents kind of... If, if someone was asked to name a drummer, right. they'll mention Ringo, you know? And Charlie Watts was in the Stones. They were super cool. And Keith Moon is like, oh, my God. He was yeah. just... That swing iconic. feel, yeah. But but Bonham represents that mixture of artistic creativity and craziness and and out thereness. But then also, that guy really really knew how to play. If you try and copy his stuff, you're gonna work. You're gonna work and you're gonna struggle. And he really really goddamn knew and knew how to play. And he's one of the most sampled. Oh, absolutely. Rock and roll drummer I think the time. thing that people don't realize is that a lot of the time when they're feeling absolutely miserable and dejected and miser and just like left out, that they're comparing their worst inside feelings to everyone's best outside appearances. And that is a horrible trap to fall into when you're sort of like, Jesus, I'm terrible at this. And you look around and it's like everyone else seems to be knocking it out of the park, but everyone else is also thinking, Fuck, I hope I don't lose this gig, you know? Yeah, I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm sure there's a cliche for that, but I'm an, I think I've probably done enough cliches in, right. this, in this show. <laughs> <laughs> so, you talked um, to, so Eight Hours is out on Chicken Ranch. You have two more records that you've recorded. Are they both in the can or is one out? Uh, they're, they're, they've been in the can a little while, but they were sort of stuck in some kind of wranglings, which is uh, all finally over now. And so right. it's just getting in in, the, in this day and age of like there you know, not being a great deal of money and I'm coercing friends to sort of work for free right. uh getting everything in place and sure. then and then i've got a fourth record coming up um, that's fantastic i I'm, I'm man i'm so lucky you know what's really funny is i come out here and i do what i do and i'll sit around and i just sort of think god damn i have to remember that there are people who would give their right arm to be doing what i've been yeah. what i get to do and gratitude I, I, i'm is important gratitude yeah. is really helpful yeah, it's it, really helpful and I think, it, it, depending on culturally where you're from, and depending on uh, where you are in your life and how you see yourself, you, you, it's very tricky to communicate how you're feeling in a way that isn't going to sort of drive people away from you and put you in that situation you don't want to be in. Because you were saying it's dangerous to compare yourself to others and right. to your worst feelings to their your worst times to their best times. I think the important thing is to, if you're going to do any comparisons to sit down and have an honest conversation with people you trust because that is how you're only, that's the only way you're going to find out people are really, where they're really at. You know, you have to have a circle of people that you can really talk to. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, and I guess also as well, pick your times to, and, and like you say, to share that and, 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 and just, also have your own setup like i'm quite lucky that i don't drink anymore and i'm not really oh, bothered I if that. i if i stay in on my own like right. uh, like i will get on an airplane and stick my headphones in and not talk to anybody and i find that really easy yeah and i love traveling alone yeah but then also like yesterday at the chicken ranch party i had one of the best days i've had all year it was, a good there day. was just incredible music everywhere so yeah. and everyone that i really care about in this crazy chicken ranch family that mm -hmm. we're in the chicken ranch record label that mike dickinson has put together that your band five eight and yep. my solo stuff is signed to mm -hmm. and it was just like i was just wondering about thinking this is just, uh, you know, because 15 years ago I f came to South by Southwest for the first time and I'm still here and someone else is believing in my music and bringing me yeah. out. And then I was meeting, you know, we had people from all over the world. We had someone people you, from you, India. You were playing Japan. with an artist, yeah. an incredible artist from India. We had people from yeah. Japan over, you know. Um, I, I think there was yeah. another English band there. And there yesterday. was an Israeli band there. There yesterday. was an Israeli band there. Yeah. Um, and I just felt. I just, I was fine there. I was totally, that was the thing is uh, it's remember, it's having your little moments where you know you're going to be totally fine. Right. And I was just wandering about going, this is great. This is amazing. And loads of cool little moments happened. Yeah. It was and good. Just, and there's just, it was, it was really, really good. And 
I definitely belong with these kinds of people because we're all a bit edgy. Yeah. But also, I think if anyone was struggling, we would reach out and, and it would be yeah. okay if you were having a shitty time. Yeah. So we're we're dead lucky, I think. Yeah. Well, I, I certainly agree. Um, so we're yeah. getting close to running out of time, but there's yeah. one thing I always wind up these interviews with. You're probably familiar with the Bernard Bevo 10 questions, if you only know them as the sort of thing that they end the actor studio uh, thing with you know Ooh, you know those 10 questions the sort of uh, what turns you on what turns you off what's your oh. favorite sound what's your least favorite sound blah 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 I'm not sure well um, inside the actor studio is a, is really popular on this side of the that, Atlantic that one I know that yeah. I know that but the 10 questions are okay. yeah but I, we do five, uh, five and it's um, it's not the same questions um, and that you know it's a work in progress next year it may be six questions it may be four it may be ten <laughs> but we'll jump right into those and I want you to just Great. answer uh, is um so off the uh, shoot from the hip. You yeah. don't have to um don't dig too deep. Yeah. Um what was the fa- what's your favorite meal that you've ever had? Favorite meal that I've ever had. Oh my god. Uh it was the breakfast at the Ace Hotel in Los Angeles. What 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 did they do at the Ace Hotel? I've never heard of this. Oh. Uh, it was just like the most ridiculous pile of awesome pancakes. Oh yeah. Well, my Americanism I use that. Awesome. It, it was just pan- I mean it was Wait, just there's a different name in there's a different name for pancakes. Uh, well, no, I just use the word awesome, which is oh, very oh, American oh, and I'm like, British. Yeah. Um so yeah, just the the amazing breakfast at the Ace Hotel for that's I mean something that's, you do regularly or was it a one-time thing? It was or? a one-time thing, so it's like really special and when, what, does it sort of is it contextual your sort of joy at this was a spiritualized tour? It was or? it was this ridiculously brilliant spiritualized gig yeah. in Los Angeles in 2014 and it was the start of me diving back into music full on. So and that's fantastic. Uh, yeah. So you started you broke more fast than just the one about food that day. Yeah. 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 I got fully I was I got fully back into the rock and roll uh, uh, diving into those pancakes. <laughs> <laughs> that's outstanding. Um what's the most frightened you've ever been? The most frightened I've ever been was when my son was uh, being born and there was like 13 doctors and medical health staff and nurses all around freaking out and it was the, and, and obviously he was basically dying in his mother's womb and it was the first time I ever prayed to God in my life to just say like, let him live and I'll do anything. Uh, cause Jesus, Johnny. Yeah, yeah. It was, uh, <laughs> it was, it was like so. This little bump that had been growing for nine months, and the the birth was horrifically complicated, and he his his mother's waters all got infected, mm-hmm. and they, and you could they were trying to say everything was like you could see them like getting mad, and it was really it was it was really really awful. And his mom was just there; she couldn't see what was going on. She was crying, but he was okay. <sighs> Uh, and it's really bizarre to like you know he's eight years old now and just amazing and the best thing that's ever happened to me uh, and it's just bizarre to think that he nearly wasn't that here. sounds absolutely terrifying <laughs> was, I'm getting quite emotional just even was, imagining myself in the same situation it was utterly it was utterly utterly horrific it yeah, was, yeah um, but luckily it had a happy ending oh, I'm so glad to hear that <laughs> of all the things you've lost what is the thing that affects you the most that you wish you hadn't lost um, so, uh, my buddy Roy, uh, who took his life in 2015 and, uh, yeah, he, he so I'd known him since I was 20 and I know his brother really well and he's the guitarist in Spiritualized and he just, yeah, that was just... What's his last name? Uh, Roy Foster and he, yeah. he was, yeah, and it, to see him get depressed and then how quickly he decided to take his own life. And I reached out to him and just said, because he was one of those people that you never would have thought would have taken his own life. And I just said, like, look, man, you can talk to me. I'll try and help you. And, and uh, you know, you think you think you can make a difference to people and you can you can trick yourself into thinking you do that. And it's just, yeah. I, I used to say everything in life happens for a reason, but... I don't agree. Him, him going, yeah. that there was no reason. So... That was really awful, and that was back in 2015. Then. Yeah, so, so yeah. sorry. Oh, it's yeah. I feel his brother suffers a lot harder than I do. How old's his brother now? Um, his brother is 50 now, I think, or maybe 49 years old. And yeah. his, his brother was like in his 40s. You know, mm, it's terrible. Male suicide. It's depression and male suicide. It's a yeah. it's a huge huge issue. Yeah, um, that's why this blog is is a great thing. Right. So, what's your favorite place to play? In the studio. Oh really? In the studio. A particular I love studio? 
Oh, well, if I had to pick one, yeah, uh, I guess it would be Toe Rag in London. Toe Rag? Uh, toe Rag, yeah, where the uh, White Stripes made Elephant and yeah. where Nick Armstrong and the Thieves, we made an album there. And yeah. it's all like tape and analog, it's analog. stuff. But, cool. I lo- but I love, I just love being in the studio because what you create is permanent. Mm-hmm. I love playing live. When you're in the studio, do you play all the instruments? Do you? Cause pretty you're, you're pretty multi instrumental. Um, uh, pretty much. I I do everything I can, like mm-hmm. drums and bass and piano and guitar and everything. But then, if someone, if you hear a killer guitar solo, generally it won't be me. <laughs> 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 uh, um, you know, so there's bits and pe- I, you know, mm-hmm. bits and pieces. But I I get to do stuff on my own, so it's real easy. No one to argue with. Right, I get the final say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you have a particular kind of drums you prefer over others? Particular, like, do you like '60s Ludwig's or '70s Gretches or? Oh. Mm, I'm a big fan of Premier because Mooney played uh, those, yeah. and Ringo started and off on Premier. Do you go Burnham as well? Hugo Burnham. Oh, he was a yeah, a Gang of Four. Ah, Gang of Four, big okay, Premier guy. Band. Yeah, yeah, and and Clem Burke played Premier. Yeah. So I've got. A, I mean, do you know what? Particular job, just pick the right tool for the job it, all kinds of stuff yeah i love drums i love guitars i love basses i've got like three pedal boards and right four amplifiers that was home, a pretty cool so. acoustic you were playing yesterday the taylor big baby yeah yeah oh, i thought it sounded great it's i'm not a, usually a taylor fan but that one was a good one that that one's okay and then stick yeah. a huge reverb on it and it just sounds right. great <laughs> and um final question yep um visa and income and all other considerations aside where would you live if you could live anywhere on the road. Big RV? Yeah. Family like in there? Yeah, I mean, uh, th- that's the only thing is being away from... Do you know the band Jusifer? Y- Yusufer? Jusifer. Jusifer, no. They're a duo. Uh, they're a couple. Yeah. They're from Athens, but they're never there. They have an <laughs> enormous RV. They drag a trailer, and they're, they're on tour 365. Wow. They'll occasionally park the RV for a week or two, but... They live on the road. Yeah, just keep moving, I think. Keep moving. Yeah. Moving, moving, moving. But obviously, you've got to have somewhere you can call home. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. at some point, you have to like just come let the steam out, you know, and just chill for a minute. I I, I love coming home. I live in the country, so nice. I like living out where it's open and quiet. Yeah, you got to have a hideout. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had a studio in my garage. I'm working on that, but oh. yeah. Hey, got a laptop right there. Take it on the right. road with you. <laughs> yeah, man, this has been great. I really appreciate you coming and doing this. Oh, I really, you know, appreciate you asking me. I feel, I feel honoured to be at the, at wow. the you know, one of the, because this is quite an, a new, a fairly new podcast. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're still very early, um, but um, I've, I've, people have been really receptive. I'm really grateful. Excellent. All right, man. Well, let's go play a show. Yeah. All right. All right. Thanks a lot. All right, that was that was great, man. Thanks, Johnny. Um, yeah, that was recorded uh, back in March in Austin uh, at South by Southwest. It was absolutely gorgeous day, and I really am grateful uh, that he was able to do that. Um, anyway, once again, uh, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is one eight hundred two seven three eight two five five. Give them a call twenty four seven, confidential, free. Um, Really, really great people behind that. Uh, train volunteers to talk you through your crisis and help you find some community resources and get some help. Remember, crash and ride at protonmail.com if you want to contact the show. And also, uh, if you want to make a contribution to keep us going, it's patreon.com slash crash and ride. Um, hit us up there. In the meantime, come see Peaky Doodle Poodle or 5-8 on the road. Come say hi, shake my hand, we'll talk it out. Support live music, go see bands. Uh, take care of yourself. Be kind to yourself. Be a part of your community, and remember, loud guitars save lives.